Um, next up, we have Comcast. We have Aljid Joy and David Zilberman. Like before, we'll have one person from the innovation and scouting and one person from the investment side of the company chatting to us. Come on up, gents. See, thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Aljid. Why don't we kick it off, as always, with uh, asking you guys to introduce yourselves, your roles, and uh, what you do within the company. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Aljit Choi. I lead uh, Comcast Innovation Labs. It's a group that, uh, that reports to the CTO at Comcast. And we've got facilities in Philadelphia as well as Sunnyvale here. Uh, it's compromised uh, folks in Plaxo as well as a few other innovation labs here in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and then uh, the, terms of the kinds of stuff I look at is anything that's probably about 18 months out. Uh, and, I, and where we're rapidly we're looking at things and how do we bring technologies into Comcast as rapidly as possible, um, either through collaboration with partners, as existing partners as well as startups, or uh, just the rapid prototyping of new capabilities that we see. Um, or you, Mike. Um, Sorry, <laughs> David. So uh, Dave Zilbern with Comcast Ventures. We are the venture investment vehicle of Comcast Corporation. We're set up to fulfill two objectives. One is a financial return on the investment, and secondarily to fund startup companies that play within the broader ecosystem that Comcast participates. So communications, digital media, advertising content, and so forth. Uh, we've been at this since uh, 99. We've made about 140 or so investments. Uh, we, l we support all of our portfolio companies as they engage with not only Comcast, but really the entire uh, service provider industry at large. Um, helping companies to develop their products and bring them out to market. Um, and uh, we're quite active with uh, offices, primary offices here in Silicon Valley, as well as New York with, office, uh, with supporting offices in Philadelphia and London. Great, so Tim from uh, Jersey Telecom was telling me it was tough to get people to, to buy into VoIP. I think Comcast solution was that was called Digital Voice, right? So 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you, know, you wouldn't be here at a telecom council meeting talking about telecom. I think today, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Comcast is a communication provider, mm -hmm. providing a range of services, just as the phone companies now are. Um, how do you feel, though, that Comcast is different from a classic telco? How does how does coming out of the cable world make you a different in the telecommunications world? Well, I, I think we have the, the the benefit of being late to the market, and so we didn't have that legacy infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, in the voice telephony business, and so our ability to roll out new features and services. Um, it, it is really somewhat unparalleled because of that infrastructure that we have, uh, which is a benefit, uh, arguably initially it was a detriment, uh, but our ability to scale to uh, eight, eight, and a half eight, eight and a half million digital voice subscribers in two, three years um, is just a testament to the team's ability to scale out the product quickly. Um, what are some of the opportunities that you've seen from the innovation side in taking that voice experience, and since it's all digital voice and doesn't have the legacy, layering on top some more interesting services? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're one of the first to kind of get caller ID on television. I mean, it's, when you talk about conversions, it's a simple stuff. You know, most people wouldn't pay for caller ID, but it's such a well-liked feature. But when we start thinking about just voice itself, it's, uh, I mean, on circuit switch phones, so there's uh, so many things you can do, but on voice over IP, you can do a ton more things in terms of converging screens. We were the first to kind of get Comcast Mobile at an I, at, on an iOS platform about 18 months, almost, uh, almost two years now, yep. where we are actually now uh, able to get your caller ID. If I'm sitting here, I can see who calls my house right now on my iOS or my Android phone. Uh, and it's it's about not just looking at voice as a home service alone. It's about making that more valuable to you wherever you are. If you wanted to know caller ID at home, why wouldn't caller ID be important to you when you're anywhere else outside of your house too? And so that's been a big part of it is how do you extend the services beyond just a fixed home only service to yeah. every single device that you can get to. So the fact that it's IP based means it's location free, it can pop up anywhere for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you do the same thing with your content, right? I mean, the content historically delivered through television, through set top yeah. box and stuff. Uh, you guys are putting out a bunch of innovations in that space. As yeah, well. I think we announced, I think last NCTA, last year's cable show, we now talk about the iPad app. We're the first to come out with the iPad app in terms of content delivery, the grid management. It was all, all about navigation and control. But very soon, in the, since November, uh, we've probably had about 12 releases, major or minor, across three different platforms, iOS, tablet, iPhones, as well as Android. And we now have uh, about 4,000 plus shows, more than anybody else, on a tablet not just HBO, it's HBO, Showtime, yep. as well as other net major networks, and the ability to actually consume that when you're not even at home. It can be traveling on the road, mm -hmm. it's included as part of your subscription, and we continue to add more and more to that. So it's, pr it's pretty interesting that, so, so it's, uh, the content is now disjointed from the home, it's the, not just caller ID information, but also the content. This is, this is specifically the on-demand content, correct? 
as yeah, opposed it, to the broadcast over the cable. I can't watch live TV. It's so uh, at, at, again, the last cable show in June, we actually demonstrated the ability to actually even watch live TV mm -hmm on an iPad inside the home, yeah. uh, where technically, yes, it could go, but it's, you know, technology is not the barrier there. Right. The content so you rights. Obviously, you got a lot of rights issues, but you do have the right then to, to show a stream of the subscribe channels on a tablet when it's on a certain Wi-Fi network through your set-top box? Yes, and so I think we've got two sets of negotiated rights, and the one is when we've had a traditional video service that people, we've always had with content providers. When Comcast Interactive Media started about five, six years ago, as it was known as Faincast, now it's XfinityTV.com, they negotiated a whole set of rights for PC and mobile device content that actually, so there's a little bit of an overlap between the content that's available on the PC, uh, where on, if you go to the PC, you can watch all the CBS, ABC, all the Hulu content on XfinityTV.com. At the same time, you can watch about 4,000 plus premium content, Showtime, HBO, et cetera, on an iPad, whether you're in the home or outside the home, over a Wi-Fi network. So for, for, from a venture perspective and from a technology innovation adoption perspective, is what you're doing similar? Are you looking for the same kind of ideas as the phone companies that we've, uh, we've talked about and we've, we've spoken with earlier today? Uh, are you looking for slightly different things? Uh, or do you find yourselves kind of calling on the same entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, I mean our, our mandate is quite broad, so anything within the communications media technology categories that I mentioned are, are open game to us. Uh, the way that we work with Comcast is we're, we're, we, look at we try to look at opportunities that might be three to five years ahead of yep. where any strategic or tactical business initiatives might be. And so we're out there, we're scouting the universe, speaking with entrepreneurs, speaking with venture investors, trying to identify themes and market opportunities. We make venture investments to support those themes and then wind up working with Comcast f to provide introductions to these startup companies. So, you know, we every six months or so get together and develop uh, five or six different themes that we that we believe will be uh, disruptive in the market, yep. um, from wireless to SMB to video to voice. Th these have all been themes uh, in the past and currently that we're exploring. I mean, and just to add to that, and we had one slide I can, uh, I can pop up here for the folks who are in, in, in the startup space here. Mm -hmm. um, we, we look at Comcast Innovation Labs, look at probably six broad categories. One is uh, just the network architecture itself, what's happening in the backbone. Uh, That's probably not, the wrong Windows slide. Windows is hell. Uh, uh, Windows is. No, not well. our slide. Uh, but <laughs> either odd, way, I can uh, talk through it. Uh, it's, <laughs> I think uh, said Windows is hell. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we've been hacked here. <laughs> there you go. Damn, damn you, Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, network architecture in general, in the backbone, et cetera, around whether where we go from optical linkages and routers, et cetera. We go uh, into connected home. That's a big part of us. Uh, we just launched our home security service um, uh, in about nine markets. So, e everything from traditional uh, broadband router and connectivity and IP, but also Zigbee and sensors inside the home. Yep. That's a big part of it. Applications in the mobile wireless space, beyond just video and content, that's another area. Uh, the fourth one is kind of social media consumer web in general, social internet. Yep. And then there's a little bit about wi wireless, mainly around Wi-Fi, where we've consistently invested in outdoor Wi-Fi, where and federates that we federate that with cable vision and Time Warner, yep. as well as Wi-Fi inside the home, where we're now uh, actually deploying uh, broadband routers. If you order a high-speed internet service from us, you get a 802.11n integrated uh, four-port Wi-Fi router. Mm -hmm. And then we also look at core technologies that can fundamentally change our know, video encoding, uh, storage in the network, et cetera, whether it's our root technologies that are, uh, again, as he said, we're kind of very broad yeah. uh, from a technology standpoint. So that's a five-point bullet list you ran through pretty quickly, and we'll get it up eventually yeah. and uh, so people can study mm -hmm. it and uh, said it'll be available afterwards for download. Sure. Yeah. But that's, uh, so that's, those are kind of the key areas looking at for innovation. And uh, you, David, you mentioned that you're looking three to five years out. Now, that seems to me like a long horizon mm -hmm. uh, and very difficult to predict. So. Uh, you know, why do you choose that kind of further for well, the vision? Well, you know, from Comcast standpoint, it's an ever-growing, ever-evolving organization. And to be able to pinpoint the specific initiatives within three to five years that the organization may go after is quite challenging. And markets change, competitive dynamics change on a regular basis. So we look at it as a way to spread our bets, quite honestly. Uh, there are certainly sectors that we invest in that don't wind up being strategic to Comcast at all. And from our perspective, we, one of the, the key tenets of our model is to make financially oriented investments. So, so long as the investments continue to stand in their, their own two legs, that's great. Yep. Um, but, you know, in, in any given year, we'll make a few investments that may not wind up being strategic and the, the, the companies that we fund may not be strategic. But 
Um, given our structure, you know, we obviously try to work with Comcast, try to develop themes, and try to invest in segments. I see. So you, you, even if you invest in something that Comcast turns a corner and doesn't it's end up adopting it, you're hoping it's ROI positive, and so okay, that's right. that, that will work for you. That's right. If overall your fund makes money, you're, you're not going to cry too hard. Around that's right. Them. Okay. Yeah, so we have two constituents within Comcast. Yeah. We have the CFO that we report to that only cares about the dollars and the cents, and then we have the CEO and COO uh, constituents that care about st strategic value. So what do you guys do in terms of vetting the ideas you have? Uh, a lot of, like when telecoms do inv investments, generally, and they can't, you know, certainly everybody mm -hmm. has their individual style, but generally they take, take it to a business unit, make sure the business unit says, yeah, that's something we can use. I'm not going to promise, but we could use that. So that kind of green lights the investment. With a three to five year out horizon, do you, have to, do you need that kind of a green light? Yeah, it's, it's a little different. Uh, so when the group started back in the late 90s by Julian Brodsky, who's one of the three co-founders of Comcast, when he set the vision, he, he realized that if we, were, if we required business sponsorship to make an investment, we wouldn't really be able to deliver on that three to five year horizon. So the investment decisions are independent from yeah. any business unit approvals. We certainly tap into Comcast. We certainly reach out to contacts within Comcast. It's a big enough organization that will likely find uh, an industry expert in anything we look at. So they certainly influence our decisions, but decisions are self-contained within the group. That is the one thing. Yeah, the one thing I'll change to that or add to that is just in, in when we look at it from the lab standpoint, it's slightly different in the sense that it's not an investment only right. opportunity. We look at it actually as almost every one of them. We look at it and say, who is potentially a a, a business owner for this that I can connect, even if it's a kind of a tangential idea, I, I, we try to look at it and say, who would potentially benefit from this? Is my voice business, my video business, my data business, mm -hmm. or my small and medium mm -hmm. enterprise, mm -hmm. right? And, and because if we don't do that, we get into this, you know, dance where we we'll never have a solution. Right. Right. We want to get to yes or no answers very quickly, but at the same time, know who the end buyer is internally. Yeah. I think this is, you know, we've we uncovered one of the challenges that telecoms have in, when, they're, when they do investing, and that is, as many of them do have to take it to a business unit and get business unit approval or engagement, uh, that does slow down their ability to pull a trigger on an investment. So uh, we've seen some telecoms, and I won't pull any names, stumble historically with that. We've seen some say, okay, we need to rework our, our methodology and shift. So they're, they're working around new ways where they're able to kind of do a bit more like, I think more like what the lab is doing than the Comcast Venture, but to get signal of interest and say that's good enough for us and then be able to pull the trigger independently uh, with, with fewer uh, people required to decide. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what a trend I've seen in uh, in-house corporate investment yeah. from the telecommunications side. And, and, you know, and you know, the the one aspect of our fund that I think has really helped us tremendously is that uh, strict adherence to financial return. Mm -hmm. uh, every deal has to stand on its own two legs, independent of Comcast. So if a company is highly strategic to Comcast, that alone doesn't warrant an investment. Uh, when the CFO reviews our portfolio, he looks at it from a dollars and cents standpoint. That's his primary filter. If it doesn't pass muster as a viable entity, we don't do the deal. And, it's, um, it's and it helps. It's kind of some, somewhat similar in terms of where, the way we look at it. We look at it saying, okay, is it going to sustain or enhance my core business? Is it going to bring me something or expand it in an adjacent market? Or is it going to be completely disruptive? And those three areas at a very high level, we look at yeah. those and say, is it, if it's disruptive and it's emerging, it's going to take a little longer time, and we can uh, sustain it through the, those prototyping stages. If it's sustaining and going to just more of an enhancement to an existing product, those typically come from existing partners. Like yeah. when they go from four-channel bonding to eight-channel bonding, that's more of an internal technology improvement from a Cisco or an Aris or somebody else that we get. Yeah. So what about wireless? Um, Comcast and many of the other, other cable operators and MSOs in the U.S. Uh, have been you know, kind of moving forward and pulling back <laughs> in wireless, and it's hard to really ascertain whether they're going all out for it. There's been you know, a spectrum purchasing and then wholesale discussions, and so it's hard to see which direction actually the, the MSOs are going. What about Comcast? What are your aspirations in wireless? And I think I, I would just leave it as saying we have all <laughs> options left on the table, mm -hmm. so it's nothing's <laughs> out of the picture, right? So we do have AWS Spectrum, we do have an investment in Clearwire, we, uh, we're heavily investing in Wi-Fi. Yep. Uh, and I think uh, Wi-Fi both in the home as well as outside the home, right? So I think what we've been seeing in these things, what Cablevision is seeing, what we're seeing is significant value in terms of how our high-speed data customers like the fact that they go out of train stations and they've got free access to on our iPhone or any other smart device. So I think the options are all on the table. So as, actually, as a Comcast subscriber, I have free Wi-Fi access in places? You, you do. You have okay. XRD Wi-Fi will pop up on your iPhone or whatever phone you use. You'll uh, find out about that. <laughs> Extra 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's part no, of it. Right. Todo incluido. <laughs> But so it's so right in there with the, it's kind of a, a loyalty play, I suppose, among other things. It, it's a, it absolutely, uh, you know, we, we, I've, we, we're 
kind of blanketing the free, our Philadelphia area with it, the New Jersey area with it. And, and it, it's not just Comcast, right? If you have Xfinity Wi-Fi, yeah. it federates with Time Warner territories as well as with Cablevision territories. So in terms of opportunity, I mean, a lot of the entrepreneurs we deal with and we see in the telecom council, they are wireless entrepreneurs and, and mm -hmm. to a great extent, also fixed stuff, which plays in with you as well. Um, but it sounds like if you guys are you know, considering all options, it means there's a lot of opportunity for somebody who has a disruptive thing, whether it's white spaces, whether it's a wholesale opportunity like Light Squared, to come and approach you and say, listen, I've got the best way for Comcast to go to market with a triple play that includes wireless. Is that, you know, you'd be willing to look at in innovations in that area? Uh, absolutely. We, we, we have those conversations all the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, it would be a big deal. I mean, any, any first step you really make where you significantly go and do launch, it's going to be a big deal. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and from an investment standpoint, we're, we're very active in the wireless space, uh, from yeah. infrastructure to towers to services. Uh, we're very, very bullish on the, on the entire ecosystem. We probably have a dozen or so uh, wireless-oriented companies in our portfolio. So another area that might be of interest for you, and I'd like to check, is, is um, Comcast historically a consumer uh, company that, that sells services consumers TV, mm -hmm. but more recently switching over and getting an enterprise connectivity and fiber, and uh, whether it's coax or fiber. So uh, what kind of innovations are you looking for on the enterprise side? Are you just selling connectivity or you're bringing along a range of services and such? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, so there, there are a few. So you're absolutely right. The business services initiative at Comcast is a relatively new initiative, but it's one that's growing very, very quickly. Uh, started with uh, cellular backhaul. Well, actually started with business class high-speed data, which is just an extension of the high-speed, the consumer residential high-speed data product. Uh, we then went into cellular backhaul, leveraging the fiber plant, the, the dense fiber plant that we have to provide connectivity to cell site, to, mm -hmm. to wireless operators. Um, we've uh, announced uh, an extension into Metro Ethernet, so providing uh, richer capabilities. Uh, we staffed up the business services organization to, with uh, 2,000 or so people, I forget exactly how many, uh, that we're selling a, a, a host of services now and continuously looking. That's a prime area of interest for us, uh, our applications and services for small, medium businesses. Um, historical enterprise products that have either been too cost prohibitive or too complicated for small businesses um, that might be easier with a, a, a fat pipe into a small business. All right. No, and I think it's, again, I would echo that. It's, it's voice, video, and data, plus all the mm -hmm. enterprise stuff of cell backhaul, PRI trunking, Metro Ethernet. So, so start, I mean, an entrepreneur or startup that had an idea that in, involved, like a, a Jersey Telecom was talking, hey, bring us your idea. If it's an enterprise-based idea, we can get it deployed here and it'd be a real good test bed. You can also say, hey, listen, we're an avenue for taking your enterprise storage solution or a data center solution, and you could be a channel for taking those to, to market as well. Is that correct? Yeah, and yeah. absolutely. We, we, we prototype those uh, pretty regularly. And then if you look at our home security application we just launched a couple of years ago, we yep. had a trial we had it in our house. And, and then uh, late last year, we launched it in Houston, and now it's in about eight other markets. Who, and, uh, so who is the partner used for home security, as an example? iControl. It's a company called iControl. iControl, right. Which they guess. invested in. Yep. Yeah. Great. And, and so are they, how many, who are they working with right now? What's their, I mean, they've engaged and made a deal with uh, Comcast. Are they white labeled through you? How are, they, how are they going to market through Comcast? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's yeah. through a Comcast channel. Uh, there are a few partners, not just uh, iControl. There are a few, the back-end monitoring mm -hmm. that's required for home security. iControl provides that technology layer. Mm -hmm. uh, the channel is Comcast. iControl provides that platform, that panel in the consumer's home. And then the, the monitoring is done by another vendor. Is there and an and upgraded set-top box for you? No, and it's more than just home security, right? We're looking at home security, monitoring, automation. We do lighting controls, energy, mm -hmm. thermostats, which are not necessarily provided by eye control. It could be any other existing communicating thermostats that are available in the marketplace. Right. So what we're doing there is there's a software layer that eye control provides, the back-end monitoring stuff that's done by regular uh, service, you know, another company. Mm -hmm. And then take. we got... Uh, uh, thermostats, lighting control, and a few other things that we continue to add in, where now you can add access Xfinity Home Security from your smartphone, PC, mm -hmm. again, another service that you can manage and monitor when you're not even at home. Great. So now in, in, the, uh, in the abstract, it says you guys have a variety of uh, tools and programs. Obviously, your lab is one of the tools and programs. Could yeah. you tell me, is that the full range, or your, our slide is up. Is, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, this, actually, this actually shows, kind of, at least from a lab standpoint, what we are looking at yep. uh, uh, very broadly, kind of the six major areas. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, labs is one, but we, we have a few other areas. We have uh, our Comcast Media Center in Denver. There's a fair amount of work around video encoding, video compression, video core video technologies. Mm -hmm. So when we see companies here, we have already, in this year, we've already sent about four different companies to test quality, et cetera, with Denver. We have a certain facility there. 
Uh, we have the platform that we acquired a couple of years ago in Seattle, so they do a fair amount of content management, content distribution on IP video. Yeah. Uh, we have Plaxo that we acquired a few years ago, so that's here in, Sun in Sunnyvale now. You know, we're in the Moffitt Tower space. So there's a fair amount of companies through which we get uh, uh, kind of companies coming in through the Comcast. Yep. Comcast Ventures sees a fair set of companies, even though they may not invest, they may pass it to us as companies right. uh, that we would work in. So it's, it, the sources are uh, a lot of them, but and then we typically work with them in terms of prototyping or directly with our engineering force and kind of engineering team to kind of get that technology into the field and maybe prototype with 12, 30, 40, 30 to 40 employees or something like that and then kind of scale it out from there. All right. So I'd like to open it up for Q&A among other things. So if we could bring the light up and uh, get a show of hands, we can start getting the microphones around as we, as we carry on down here. There's one question up in the front. Um, so can you tell, tell us a little bit about your most recent investment? The one that you, that you are able to talk about. Most recent public one. I'm just yes. trying to think about what's the most recent public investment we've made. Um, Flipbook? No, nah, that's not interesting. Um, well, actually, I'll tell you one that's not that's right. not public, actually, but there will be public in uh, two weeks. Um, well, sooner than that, if you tell us. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, it's, it's fine. Um, so we, uh, we started a tower company, actually, a wireless tower company. Um, we... Uh, we're looking at through the venture stamp, uh, perspective at a few uh, investments in tower companies. Um, learned that, lo and behold, at Comcast is a rather significant portfolio of towers. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we went out and started an independent tower company for the purposes of monetizing space. Yep. Uh, the cable plant has evolved uh, to either satellite-based or fiber-based. Microwave isn't used too much anymore, and, and those uh, towers were underutilized. And so we saw a, an interesting business opportunity to go out and start a, a new tower company. Interesting. That is a, that's, that's good news. Yeah. So, and that's, um, I suppose it's, that's uh, the neutral host tower, but it is something that's, that's right. a trend that's been you know, developing over, the, over a while in North America. But mm -hmm. obviously, uh, a lot of carriers actually choosing to sell their towers back into neutral, neutral hosts mm -hmm. and want to get that capital out that they can reinvest in network technology. That's right. That's and from Comcast standpoint, it was not a, a core focus for the business. Uh, the grant scheme of the organization, it was an insignificant revenue stream. And so we saw a way to minimize distractions, but yet create a lot of value. Cool. So, uh, Alan, you got a question? Uh, yes. Uh, this is for Ajit. A couple of years ago, and continuing to 2000. We haven't, we haven't got the mic on. Just, uh, it's on. Okay. The uh, question is for Ajit. 2009 and 2010, Comcast was fairly aggressive as a Clearwire and b and reselling their mobile WiMAX uh, service. Haven't heard anything about that uh, this year. Has that now been abandoned in favor of outdoor Wi-Fi? And my the crux of my question is, what are you pursuing in outdoor Wi-Fi? Uh, tests have shown that it uh, is not a very good technology, uh, uh, propagating winds, uh, propagating through trees, buildings, and you really do need line of sight and distance is limited. Uh, I believe we're still selling high-speed data to go. We are, we are yeah. actually st we're still selling the broadband data cards and we have a MiFi version of the same thing with the clear wire. I don't hear you announcing it, I don't hear you announcing in more cities. Hmm. Well, we're, we're, we're dependent on clear wire, yeah. right? So we're not deploying the network, it's dependent on clear wire. Whenever they launch a market is when we can go into a market and offer services in the markets that in our footprint, where they've deployed, we do sell services. We continue to push it in, in the markets where we're in, and that's continuing to do it. So there's no change there. Uh, in terms of Wi-Fi, actually, we've, we've seen a, you know, I agree with the propagation characteristics, et cetera, on Wi-Fi, but we've actually seen a fair amount of uh, uh, uptake in terms of the service and usage where we believe that where we can actually put on strand mounters. It's not a huge cost for us. Uh, we invest in a company that actually supplies the radios for that, too. And so for us, it's actually putting a wherever we have aerial mount where we actually own the facility, we're able to put this in public areas and actually get relatively good uh, usage on these things for our high-speed data customers. The, and it's the actually been to, to do Wi-Fi right, if, you, if your ambition is to cover, to blanket a city, you'll fail. No, no we've, we've yeah. not yeah. said but that. You said train stations, the example yeah. I mentioned before. If your ambition is to cover a train station, yeah. you will likely succeed. Are you talking about hotspots? Are you talking about true metro coverage? No, it's mostly hotspots. Hot in zones, maybe. No, no, yeah, it's it's hot. We call it hot zones more than hotspots. Transient locations. Yep. So a question from the center, and then there's going to be one over here. Oh, let's take the center first, then we'll go here, and then we'll go back over there, and that's all we have time for. Uh, <coughs> thanks. Uh, um, Michael Tyler from Essex Lake Group. Um, Two-part question, if I may, short one. The uh, first part is for Ajit, and the second half is for David Brett, maybe. Could you uh, uh, hold the mic a little closer? Oh, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, 
a two-part question. The first is for Ajit, the second is for, for David, but they're related by me. Um, the, the, I don't the, think they're related. No, <laughs> no, but the, but their answers maybe. The questions, sorry. Maybe. Are, are you? Brothers from a different mother. Okay. Well, you never know, you know. <laughs> a lot has changed. The, the, um, uh, we've seen telcos and cellular operators um, uh, all over the world go through this transition where they see that, that an, uh, uh, becoming an open platform with, with relatively open APIs to, to independent providers of applications has been the way to go in terms of revenue development. Uh, Comcast, coming from an MSO heritage, has a different kind of history. So my question is, the first part is, uh, what is Comcast's stance about um, openness to third-party provided applications and opening the, the, the network through APIs? And then uh, maybe the David part of the question is, um, depending on the answer to that first part, what are the implications for, um, for the kinds of entrepreneurial startups that you invest in that might might in some cases, use APIs on Comcast's network? Uh, to the first part, I would say, you know, we've transitioned a lot of our development around whether it's voice, video, or data has moved to open standards-based platforms. So that was, that's kind of the first step, moving away from proprietary cable platforms to more open IP as well as other standards. Uh, that has, first of all, enabled us to kind of do what we did with the iPad and the iPhone and the Android systems. Part of it is there's a fair amount of work on the back end that needs to happen to kind of make those, expose those APIs even to our own internal applications. And we constantly go back and forth on this. And I think one of the challenges it always brings up is when if you open that API up to somebody who is an application developer, if something goes down and a customer has to make a call, who do they call? Do they call us? Do they call the application developer? And so there's, that's just one of the concerns in terms of how open you make it. It's, it's, it's a constant point of discussion, but I think one of the first things we're trying to do is at least get our applications on open standards based platforms that allows us to kind of get there. There's a fair amount of work that's happening in cable labs to kind of, again, standardize it across the MSO industry. Canoe is another example of that's happening, but you can start to see how long it takes to kind of make that across the industry. So it's, it's, it is a, it's a desire. It, it definitely takes time. Uh, I, and it, also, I want to kind of point out that two other people, if you have more questions about this, is John Carney, who's sitting right behind you, I think. He's uh, the Comcast person, but he's actually with Cable Labs. And there's Satish Ramakrishnan, who is also here. Uh, he leads Comcast Innovations Labs here in Sunnyvale. So he's available to you, anybody over here. Well, let, let, let's do the stand thing, because this is you know, <laughs> critical. So get, so the Satish, uh, is he here? So he does oh, yeah. your labs in Sunnyvale? Yep, Excellent. labs in Sunnyvale. And with uh, Cable Labs? Right. John Carney is actually yep. in San Francisco. All right. And, the, and one other example uh, to Alja's response, um, there's an initiative in the cable industry called True Two-Way, or eBIF, which essentially publishes APIs to access the set-top box to be able to surface applications, whether they be advertising related, whether it be a polling or a voting application, um, onto that television through the set-top box. So there certainly are initiatives to do that. From a venture standpoint, we're very open to that. We look at businesses um, that support the cable system on a regular basis, whether through public, publicly pu published APIs or not. So we're certainly open to it. We don't shy away from it at all. So let's, uh, let's jump up to one. I think Greer, you had a question on your side, and then the last one will be over here. Yes. Take this side first, thanks. Um, a, a quick question f uh, regarding the comment about the connected home earlier in the uh, presentations. I'm just curious from a standpoint of both uh, subscriber uptake and monetization, what kind of things are you finding interesting so far in the connected home beyond just traditional entertainment related type of applications? Yeah, I think uh, one of the main things is just fundam fundamental foundational stuff, just having network connectivity inside the home. So that's one of the biggest things we're looking at when we look at Wi-Fi uh, and then coverage inside the home. So one of the reasons why we're invested in our own cable modems to have a, uh, we actually call it a wireless gateway, to have a 802.11n, even eventually moving to the next level of Wi-Fi uh, capability with a dual band, uh, uh, capability also in the device, foundationally providing the best con Wi-Fi connectivity because that's where we see the most amount of growth among customer-owned devices. Uh, the second piece we see is, is, was, was as we started to deploy home security and monitoring automation, we ended up selecting Zigbee as a platform. Again, again, Zigbee allows, within mesh technology, allows you again for a cap very stable network for alerts and monitoring inside the home that could be also beyond used beyond home security. So between Wi-Fi and then we've also on the wired side, we've invested in Mocha. Again, the, and the primary reason around that is uh, because it, when you look at multiple HD streams to be streamed around the home, it needs to be Mocha, Mocha tends to be Mocha, the most reliable one Mocha right now. Mocha for everybody else is, is the uh, sending content over it's, coax cable. It's, it's a multimedia or coax alliance, but essentially it allows for streaming inside the home over coax, and pretty much 98 or 99% of homes in the U.S. 
are wired of coax, and that, that's a base standard there. So that's the foundational stuff. We continue to do applications across, so most of our applications that we've released in the last year are all IP-based, running on all screens. So, and I think it's almost cloud-based for most, so our, entire, our home security application is all sitting on a server. What I get on an iPhone is the same as what I get on a portal on my uh, PC. It's the same that I see on my little tablet screen at home in terms of the cameras, in terms of alerts, in terms of the rules that I set, everything. Can I ask a quick follow-up to that? Sure. So, so I'm curious in terms of how you actually kind of build out the business model. Because, I mean, does that become, given you provide the foundations, do you then, using that foundation, you go to market with a partner that specializes in security, kind of build out the application, and uh, you partner that? Or are you actually building out the application and then selling it to your customers as another value-added service on top of their uh, cable subscription? Uh, almost all of our products or services, whether it's voice video data, has some device component in the home that's yeah. subsidized by the service. So with set-top boxes, whether it's a cable modem, whether it's a... Uh, security camera? And I'm sorry? A security camera? Security camera. In, in some cases, we subsidize some of the gear, but the cameras, I think, that you purchase, and it depends on the package you pick. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have sensors that go with it. There's a tablet that goes with it, and there's a camera that goes with it, too, in certain case, depending on the package you pick. And that's part of the service. That's historically what service providers have done is it's part included in the device or it's a subsidized device. Okay, great, thank you. I think generally if you want additional cameras, you would buy them yourself at, at a full rate, yeah. right? Because once you get the subscription with the first exactly. camera, you're, you're subsidy you desired. Right, and that's very similar to the home security space. That's in a, any additional device beyond the, the first few sensors, and the customer pays for it because that tends to vary extremely uh, across customers. So let's take our last question, hopefully a quick one. Yeah, hi, on. my name's Dan, <clears throat> excuse me, Dana Topping with Intellisys. Um, th this question's more related to your business application and services. Um, today, you're able to offer like Metro E, um, new in the Bay Area, um, and it's primarily over the, the Comcast footprint. Do you, the question is, do you foresee any uh, 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 ubiquitous coverage and an eyes between the c other cable codes. What's the what's the roadmap for that, and what do you think the time frame is? Um, from a I mean, right public now, standpoint, yeah, it's not. it's pretty much in footprint right yeah. now. It's a, it, we're just started in there. There's yeah. so much opportunity there. I think the focus is on in Comcast footprint. Yep. All right. So uh, with that, I think I'd like to thank you very much, David Algid. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you. Great. And uh, as I did the last couple of times, there's a lot of seats up in the front, so if anybody would like a seat, the front rows, the second rows are virtually empty, so come on down. Second row is wide open. So uh, we I touched on a bit there the, um, the pace of telco investment, so maybe we'll have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions about that with, uh, with Rakesh in the next session.